think that is where there's tremendous untapped potential uh, for us to take advantage of advertising, of viral videos that are now available and easy to do with much less resources because of the power of the internet, so that people whose lives are most impacted by the issues that we mm -hmm. care about are giving their testimonials and taking it straight to the person we want to talk to. Mm -hmm. There are a whole range of options that are available to us, and if those more creative methods of communicating are going to capture the hearts of the people to whom we are communicating, then we can send them to the places where they're going to get much more rich information and then be able to take that next important step, which is to yeah. click a button right. and say, I care about this issue and send it to the people who should be making decisions. I, I like way. that, and I want to come back to that because I want to ask you more about those creative ways of communicating that are much more accessible to most of us than the thing I'm going to ask you about All you now, right. which is the <laughs> nightly news. Yes. Uh, I mean, the 24-hour news cycle that just responds to the most animated discussion, whether it's Britney Spears' divorce or, how do I know that, you know, or anything else like that. Know. I don't even want to know. How do I know these things? And it's because it's coming at you every moment. How do we make the discussions about poverty and opportunity and inclusion as animated as those discussions so that while we're using the things that we have access to on the internet, our blogs, the reports that we put out, our websites, there's something about getting the pulse of the nation talking about these things every night that we just can't penetrate. How do we get into that cycle? Um, there are very real constraints to our ability to do that, yeah. one. And I think we ought to just be real about it and therefore be intentional about taking advantage of other um, tools that are at our disposal. With that caveat being said, mm -hmm. I would say that there are two things that we should think about. Um, one, I think, has to do with finding a way to give voice to the people who are most impacted by poverty. That is, people who are poor. Mm -hmm. Speaking with their own voice about their ability to overcome odds that most people think are insurmountable in the way that, that is um, helpful. And let me just put some context there. That often when we have people who come from poor communities talking about their circumstances and how they were able to overcome, we make the mistake of making it seem as though these are extraordinary yes, we feats. Do. When all of, it, all, all of us in this room know that there are lots of people who live in poverty, who are heroes every day, because they can just survive mm -hmm. from day to day, week to week, month to month. And the heroism of um, living in environments where all of the social dynamics come into play, that create difficulty for just the, the average person, you know, the, the, um, the exercise that the gentleman talked about mm -hmm. earlier, where you sort of simulate what it's like living in a world of poverty people don't fully appreciate the complexity or the challenges that are involved in when it comes to living that kind of life. And so what I would say is that it's important for us to create venues and to train people who are in these communities to talk about their experiences, their visions for themselves, and most importantly, to celebrate how they have been able to succeed. And in doing so, make sure that we lay the responsibility not just in the laps of those individuals, but also in the laps of the institutions, which we know have a responsibility for, for supporting those people. And so what I'm saying to you is that there are ways for us to elevate, highlight the compelling stories that I think can be tapped. Maybe it's not on the network news, but it most certainly would be fodder for local television where they're looking for human interest stories all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can present those heroes, those everyday people who are doing tremendous things with the support of their community, um, and maybe be able to highlight how they were able to accomplish it through partnerships, mm -hmm. then I think that also is interesting. One of the, the things that um, made our now five-year campaign to uh, raise awareness about the need for more health coverage insurance was this idea of having strange bedfellows. It was a term that was actually identified by members of the press mm -hmm. 
when we tried to explain to them that this was a concerted effort, yes, funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, but also 20 other organizations, and joined by a coalition of strange bedfellows, unions, commerce leaders, mm -hmm. insurers, providers, we're all coming together in this effort to raise awareness to have you know, more than 10,000 events in a year. And the news was not just that, well, look at how difficult the health care crisis is. People knew that already. Mm -hmm. The news was, can you believe we've got all of these people coming together working on something as complex as this? And the only way we were able to do it, not coincidentally, was to make sure that it was a totally nonpartisan conversation mm -hmm. where people could say, here's a value that we all share. Here's an outcome that we can all agree to. We have very different notions about how to accomplish those goals. Just as many, like as many as people we have in this room, there are probably different mm -hmm. <laughs> examples, ideas about how to solve a problem. But just the fact that you could get these people together and say that they are committed to this vision and allocating resources to do it and having people from Wachovia and other people mm -hmm. involved is a compelling story and I think it's something that can be helpful to That's us. That's interesting. This raises a couple of points for me because that's a very sophisticated response that you just gave me and most community-based organizations have no capacity to have that conversation or to roll out a strategy based on the results of thinking it through. Uh, what do you think the role of foundations ought to be in terms of helping community-based organizations increase their capacity? PolicyLink has a communications office, but we're a national organization, and among national organizations, I'd say we probably have devoted more of our resources to communication than most, but most local organizations don't even have a communication person at quarter time working for them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's, uh, that we ought to be building up that capacity, or are we be making organizations like yours available to them if you thought about this the best way? I'm so glad you asked that question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to answer it the way you think that I am. Oh. Um, I think that there are... As a lawyer, uh -huh. you know, they say never ask a question you, you don't know, know the answer, answer to. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just telling you up front, I'm not going to bury my lead. Um, sure, organizations like ours can help foundations. We do it all the time. We've done it for 20 years. We've done it for more than 150 um, organizations, mm -hmm. and we're available to do that. There also is a huge potential for us as a, a philanthropic community to galvanize our resources and to share in communications outreach. Mm -hmm. That might involve working with a firm like ours that has some history and understanding how you structure that kind of work and create some consensus about the direction that you should move and maybe do some piece of execution. But ultimately, what I would want to advocate is this notion of having the philanthropic community, and it doesn't have to be a whole bunch of you, just deciding that you're going to come together and pool resources to elevate the issue and to do it in a strategic communications framework. Because even though many of the foundations that are represented here have lots of resources, and they may have lots of resources for communications, there's no doubt that the impact that can be felt if resources are pooled um, would be far more um, important. And I think compelling to many of the um, individuals in the media and potential partners who I think would take notice if they saw that all of the things that the foundation world is focused on, you've decided to <coughs> collaborate in this effort. I mean, hey, think about it. If you've got uh, five foundations who decide that they're going to come together and do this, you're kind of strange bedfellows too. Mm -hmm. Because people very much think of, um, within the foundation world and externally, as you know, people sort of operating in silos. This is my turf and you know, I'm doing this outreach to help with my fundraising and this is my space. I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I'm offending you guys, but I'm ho hopefully speaking mm -hmm. truth here. Mm -hmm. um, operating in other areas um, to raise visibility about their program. I think that the, the notion that I would like to put forward is that there is a huge impact to be felt by coalition building within the foundation world itself to address poverty, especially because the causes and the solutions are so multifactorial. 
So you won't be stepping on each other. 